and a deep sense of compassion, and you begin to get a feeling for the man. Born in Altoona, Pennsylvania in 1921, Rabbi Bierman was ordained and received his master's in Hebrew letters and an honorary Doctor of Divinity degree at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Cincinnati. His first pulpit upon ordination was a, with a tiny congregation on the west side of Los Angeles. He has yet to find another congregation that suits him. Thank you, Catherine. Is this working? Can you hear me? If you can't, please raise your hand. Good job, everybody. <laughs> I should begin with a, a disclaimer. Uh, this program uh, is designated as a history of the Jews of Los Angeles. And that's not what's going to happen here today. <laughs> and it all happened this way. Uh, I had lunch with uh, our educational director, Avram Mandel, and he said to me, in the course of the lunch. I understand that you were a good friend of Hank Greenberg. And I said, yes, that's true. He said, you must have a lot of stories to tell about how things were when you first arrived in the year 1949. Uh, would you be willing to tell them on Yom Limud? And I said, yes. And then I saw the announcement of the program, the printed announcement, and suddenly I'm supposed to be talking about the history of the Jews of Los Angeles. So you, what you're going to get this morning is something characteristic of me that all of you uh, have encountered before. It'll be kind of a series of vignettes, things that have happened since my late wife, Martha, and I came to Los Angeles in July of 1949. As for Hank Greenberg, are the, I'm sure that everybody in this congregation has heard of Hank Greenberg. He was the preeminent uh, baseball player of his time. Uh, he played for originally for the Detroit Tigers, and he came on the scene in the year 1933. I was 12 years old at the time. I didn't realize it at the time that he was just 10 years older than I. But I was 12, living 90 miles north of Detroit, and this Jewish ball player came on the scene and began to hit the ball such as had never been hit before. And it was an extraordinary thing, especially for little Jewish boys all over the country to have a Jewish hero, to have a Jewish baseball player of such uh, preeminence. And one of the significant moments that occurred in Greenberg's career happened a year later in 1934. The Tigers were lodged in a pennant race, a great deal of excitement and anxiety, and suddenly Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur appeared. And the question was, as it would be for Sandy Koufax later on, and even for Sean Green and a few other Jewish players whom we came to know, would Greenberg play on the High Holy Day? Well, Greenberg went to a rabbi in Detroit to seek his advice. And this rabbi, who was probably the reform rabbi of the large congregation in Detroit, I've never really learned his name, told him it was okay to play on Rosh Hashanah, but he shouldn't play on Yom Kippur. So Greenberg played that Rosh Hashanah. He actually hit two home runs and helped the Tigers win the game. But on Yom Kippur, he didn't play. And the Detroit Free Press, the dominant newspaper of Detroit, published in broad letters the greeting, Lashana Tova, Hank. Now, this 
this is not Los Angeles in the days of Sandy Koufax, Los Angeles, with its significant Jewish population. I was the only Jewish. No, there were two of us in my grammar school. My sister and I were the only two Jews in our grammar school. And when I reached high school, there were two Jews, and I was one of them. Furthermore, Detroit was the seat of anti-Semitic propaganda. There was Henry Ford in Dearborn, who had published the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And there in Royal Oak, Michigan, a suburb of Detroit, just 12 miles from downtown Detroit, was Father Charles Coughlin, a fiery uh, Catholic uh, priest, a brilliant preacher, and filled with admiration for Hitler and later, I and mean, also his remarks and his papers tinged with anti-Semitism. So Greenberg didn't play on Yom Kippur, and of course, the Tigers lost. A very popular poet at the time wrote this. His name was Edgar Guest. Some of you are old enough to remember Edgar Guest. <clears throat> the Irish <clears throat> the Irish didn't like it when they heard of Greenberg's fame, for they thought a good first base baseman should possess an Irish name. And the Murphys and Mulroonies said they'd never dream they'd see a Jewish boy from Bronxville, Bronxville out where Casey used to be. Come Yom Kippur, holy fast day worldwide over to the Jews. And Hank Greenberg, through his teaching and old tradition true, spent the day among his people. And he didn't come to play, said Murphy to Mulrooney. We shall lose the game today. We shall miss him in the infield and shall miss him at the bat. But he's true to his religion, and I honor him for that. Well, he was true to his religion on that particular day, even though in those days he was a totally indifferent Jew and totally uninvolved in Jewish religion or Jewish knowledge. The wonder of it all was in the 1970s, I found myself belonging to the Beverly Hills Tennis Club. And who was a member of the club? Along with me, my boyhood hero, Hank Greenberg. We became friends. We used to smooth. And we talked even about Jewish things. About that Yom Kippur, he told me that he had been taken to the the large conservative synagogue in Detroit on Yom Kippur Day. And when he arrived, the congregation was in the midst of its prayers. And when they saw Greenberg enter all six foot three or four inches of himself, the entire congregation arose and began to applaud. And this 20-some-year-old boy, Hank Greenberg, big and strong as he was, was embarrassed, deeply embarrassed, he told me, to receive such attention. Well, we occasionally played together, we talked together, and he told me of what it was like to be a Jewish ball player in those days, uh, and of his ignorance of Jewish tradition, and uh, when he died, of the blood of cancer, I was asked by his family to conduct the funeral for the family. And I learned in talking to his three children that one day he said to them, you're not going to school today. And they said, why not? He says, it, it's something called Yom Kippur, and we're not going to school. And he said that he took the children to the Hayden Planetarium in New York. And that's what they would do every Yom Kippur. They would go to the Hayden Planetarium. Later on, Greenberg, who never wanted to be known as just a Jewish baseball player, but a great baseball player, later on, he wanted to be known as a Jewish great Jewish baseball player as well. 
he developed a greater sensitivity and consciousness and appreciation of his Jewishness in his latter years. And he was a very significant figure in my life as a boy growing up in a tiny town uh, to have this powerful, great Jewish person out there among the others. When Jackie Robinson began his career in Major League Baseball in 1947, Greenberg was no longer playing for the Tigers. He told me that in 1946, he had returned from the war. He was the first baseball player to enlist to serve in World War II. He told me that the owner of the Tigers, a Mr. Briggs, had seen a picture of Greenberg wearing a Yankee uniform. And he immediately leapt to the conclusion that Greenberg wanted to leave the Tigers and go play for the Yankees. And he fired him. He fired Greenberg after all those years. And he arranged with baseball players only, with baseball owners of the American League, that none of them would accept them, would accept Greenberg, would hire him. So he ended up playing. The reason he was in the... Yankee uniform, incidentally, is that he was in the Army, and they played some games, and they gave him a, that uniform to wear, and a picture was taken while he was serving in the Army. Anyway, he spent the last year of his career, his baseball career, as a player in what was then lowly Pittsburgh in the National League, and that's how it all ended for him. Well... That was Hay Hank Greenberg, the Hank Greenberg part of today's story. And now I want to talk about something else. I want to tell you about the beginnings of Leo Beck Temple since there are many legends about how the congregation came into being. It may come as a surprise to you uh, to learn that this congregation was conceived in an office on the third floor of a building in the heart of Hollywood, on Hollywood Boulevard at Wilcox. It was conceived there in the bright sunlight, one of those clear days that used to bathe all of Los Angeles before all of us came to town and dirtied up the place. And it was conceived, not what you're thinking, but on a wall map in that office when the fertile imagination of Rabbi Alfred Wolf, he was then the regional director of the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, which is now called the Union of Reform Judaism, he surveyed the map one morning and noted a green pin set at the corner of Wilshire Boulevard and Hobart. That was Wilshire Boulevard Temple. And another green pin to the north and west at the corner of Hollywood Boulevard at Fuller, and that was Temple Israel of Hollywood, and still another green pin on Wilshire Boulevard near Palm Drive in Beverly Hills, and that was where Temple Emanuel was at the time, Temple Emanuel of Beverly Hills, and contemplating that in the vast sea of Jews along Pico Olympic and Wilshire between Western Avenue on the east and Beverly Hills on the west, there was not a single Reformed congregation. Rabbi Wolf took one of his red pins and aiming somewhere in the midpoint, near the midpoint, closely as he could estimate, he stuck a pin in the map and it penetrated somewhere near the corner of Olympic and La Brea. And Edgar Magnan, with whom Alpha, who was the leading rabbi of Los Angeles for so many years, the rabbi of Wilshire Boulevard Temple, the largest and most distinguished of the Reformed congregations of Los Angeles, 
Edgar Magadan, with whom uh, Rabbi Wolf would become an associate rabbi the year that I, I would arrive, Edgar, in his characteristic genteel use of the language for which he was then famous, said, that Alfred Wolf sticking those pins, if he's not careful, he's going to stick somebody in the ass. Now, that was the manner of the conception of Leo Beck Temple. <laughs> A map, a Jewish mind at work, a sunlit day, Jews out there, a pin to stick with. That's all that was needed to conceive a temple, a temple that was a, to be a pain in the ass <laughs> to this community. In a matter of months, a small group had begun to take shape. They were helped by some of the uh, volunteers from the Walter Boulevard Temple Men's Club. They held outdoor services in the garden on Lucerne, a little bit south of, of Wilshire. And thanks to the generosity of uh, theater owner, Cheryl, the late Cheryl Corwin, uh, they were able to use the facilities of the Forum Theater, which is located uh, on Pico and Norton, just east of Crenshaw, it's a church now, I think the Korean church, but it was a theater at that time. And they incorporated the temple officially in October of 1948. And six months later, with just a few hundred dollars in the bank, not really able to walk like any newborn, they decided that if they want to survive and grow, they would need a permanent rabbi. This was leading naturally to me. And Jack Skirball, a member of the Board of Governors of our rabbinical school in Cincinnati, the Hebrew Union College, was about to attend a meeting of the board. And so he was empowered to an interview the graduating class of the year 1949, of which I was a member. There were 11 of us in the class. Now, don't believe for a moment that I was invited to become a rabbi on the basis of merit. Getting things on merit is one of the persistent myths of America. No, I got the job because my wife, Martha, or rather because her cousin and her dear friend, Tom Freiberg, put in a good word for me. Even then, even as he would throughout his life, and the whole history of this congregation hangs on the circumstance of Tom Freiberg having moved to Los Angeles in the year 1948 and being here now in 1949, so that when Jack Skirball interviewed me along with the 10 other members of our graduating class, he gave me a knowing wink. And he, he told us about this new congregation, about its glorious future, about the marvelous people who were already members of it, and about those who would become members. And he rattled off some names. But the only one I had heard of before was that of the writer Irving Stone. So when I came for my interview in May, 1949, riding the Santa Fe Railroad across the country, I was armed with two books, one by Carrie McWilliam about Southern California, and the other, Lust for Life, <laughs> which stimulated my still in short appreciation and love for art and the men and women who created. I finished Lust for Life just as we left Albuquerque. Well, the tiny board and I said yes to one another. And Martha and I arrived in July of 1949. We drove a white DeSoto convertible across the country, came down the coast, entered Sunset Boulevard at the coast, and drove through Beverly. It was a bridal path in those days that ran through Beverly Hills. 
people riding on horses, passing the Beverly Ho Hotel as he did to get to the Freiburg home. You could see for miles in those days, everywhere. So I had no office when I began. We rented an apartment in Westwood, a two-bedroom apartment for $110 a month. And I had no telephone. There was a shortage of telephones in Los Angeles following the war. We had to wait three or four months to get one. My office was the payphone at the Chevron station at the corner of Gailey and, and, and uh, Lacan. Um, we had no place to meet. We were still meeting in a garden. We held our services in the garden of a home of the Kramer family. They were members of Wilshire Boulevard Temple and were nice enough to give us this garden. And then we rented a church uh, in Carthay Circle, an Episcopal church at Crescent Heights and Olympic, and held our services there and also had about six children or so in our religious school, and we used to use a mezzanine in a supermarket that no longer exists at 8th and Abrea. And that, I don't know, we have one member of our congregation who was, who is a member of the temple, Marilyn Daniels is her name, and she's on our board now, and she was one of those children who was in that class. I think she's the only one the only one in the entire congregation who remains in those days. But shortly thereafter, we bought a small building at 484 South San Vicente, the San Vicente near La Cienega. It had been a Canadian Legion Hall. It had room for exactly 131 seats. And we got some seats from a movie theater that had gone out of business in Culver City and brought the seats and reupholstered them in a green, a bright green color, 131 of them. And we had a wonderful member of the congregation in those days, Harry Horner, who twice had won Academy Awards for art direction uh, in the movies, and he designed for us the interior of our little temple. And the work was done by uh, a man who was a brother of the very uh, significant character actor of the time. Some of you will remember him, George Sanders. Well, his brother was the one who did the interior uh, of, of the Leobet Temple. And uh, the building actually had this small auditorium, a patio, and behind it, a two-bedroom apartment over the garage. The garage became our social hall. And initially, the two-bedroom apartment served to provide a space for the few children uh, we had in our religious school. Later on, one of our members, Dr. Woodrow Miller, uh, took Wednesday afternoon off, maybe the whole day Wednesday, which was characteristic of doctors in those days, is it still? Uh, and he would bring his child to Hebrew school, and he planted some flowers around the fig tree that was in the middle of the patio, and he tended his garden every week on Wednesday when he came to bring his child to religious school. One week, Woody was on call, and he was called to a home, someone who needed doctor. A little boy answered the door, and he said, I'm Dr. Miller. And the little boy screamed out to his parents, he's no doctor, he's a gardener. <laughs> uh, they tore down 484 South San Vicente just a couple weeks ago. I don't know what of it remains anymore. And the only thing that remains of San Vicente in our synagogue is the Ner Tamid, the eternal light. That was brought over from San Vicente 
It was designed for us by a very significant silversmith at the time, Alan Adler. He was the one who made that Nair Tamiz. And it's with us uh, still. Um, I interrupt this tale to tell you about one of the great moments in the history of Leo Tambo, and maybe one of the greatest controversies that we may have had. And that would occur in 1957 when we had purchased this property, 11 acres of land for $70,000 and we're already beginning to think about the designs of this new synagogue building, and we had to make a decision about what kind of seat we were going to have in the sanctuary. So the architect brought to our social hall, the garage <laughs> of 484, samples of different kinds of seats. There were individual seats. There were pew backs with seats within the pews, and then there were pews alone. And every Friday night for three weeks, people would come to sample the seats. And the sight of Tochus's descending, <laughs> uh, you know, into each of these various seats, I mean, really filled my heart <laughs> uh, with laughter. Well, you're sitting in what we eventually chose. These are the pews without the individual seat. And of course, we have new upholstery. Upholstery, I'm not sure, is any more or less comfortable uh, than what was before. Well, 1949, a lot of things were happening here in this country and in uh, and in uh, and in the country, uh, and in Los Angeles. The specter of anti-Semitism persisting after the time of the destruction of European Jewry helped to create a proliferation of Jewish fraternal, social, and protective organizations here in Los Angeles in the late 40s. Not the least of these organizations was Los Angeles CRC, it was called, the Community Relations Committee of the Jewish Federation Council. It was a kind of United Nations of all the local and national organizations concerned with anti-Semitism. There was the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Committee, the American Jewish Congress, the Jewish Labor Committee, the Jewish War Veterans, the Jewish Fraternal Order, and 32 others. And the chairman of the CRC was Mendel Silverberg. Mendel Silverberg, who was a very eminent uh, Republican. He was the vice president and general counsel of Columbia Studios and other studios. He was a close friend of then Republican Governor Earl Warren, who didn't reveal any of his liberal tendencies to us. Uh, in those days, and a close friend of President Eisenhower. And as the Cold War heated up, so did the Jewish community's fear of anti-Semitism associated with the work of Senator Joe McCarthy. But then it was the failure throughout the nation to distinguish between a communist as a theoretical Marxist and a communist as an espionage agent. With the arrest of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg in 1950 as atomic spies, the link in the public mind between being a Jew and being a communist traitor began to grow and began to concern the work of these community agencies. Scratch a Jew, a communist, and you'll find a Jew. And this fear permeated uh, Jewish community leaders. And when the, the uh, and, and they turned many of them from a concern with anti-Semitism itself to a concern with communists among the Jews. And so it was that they expelled from the Association of Jewish Organizations 
the Jewish People's Fraternal Order, which originally had been founded as a communist group, but at the, at the time they expelled it, it was a group of AKs, a group of old men, most of the time meeting to play cleanup. But they threw them out because of the fear of communism. And of course, what was going on in the movie industry, the Hollywood Ten, the development of the blacklist, and soon we were engulfed in the work of the House Committee on Un-American Activity and the search for communism in the movie industry. Of the first Hollywood Ten who refused to testify, six of them, six of them were Jews, and many of them brought before the House Committee on Activity were indeed Jews, Jews working in the movie industry. And that struck our temple as well. We had two writers in our congregation, one of whom, very successful writers, one of whom was what was called a friendly witness, who testified not only about his own affiliation, but gave names, name names of others who, whom he knew uh, were a part of these groups. And also, we had a member of our congregation, another writer, who refused to testify. But what was difficult was that each of them had a son, and they were in the same class in Sunday school. One who had testified, naming the name of the other, and the other who was the victim of having been named. Both of them were blacklisted for a time, not even... Uh, naming names and cooperating fully uh, with the House Committee uh, was a guarantee uh, of being able uh, to get the job. So that was an issue that stirred us in the Rosenberg case in particular. Uh, anyone uh, who is interested in seeking clemency for the Rosenberg, feeling a death penalty for them was, was wrong was also thought to be a communist. I belonged to one of the groups working to have that pen of the death penalty reduced. And just to indicate something of my own timidity, you know, the Rosenberg's case was an entirely Jewish case. The prosecutor was Jewish. The defense attorney was Jewish. The defendants were Jewish. The judge was Jewish. And they were sentenced to die on Shabbat, July 19th, 1953. They later changed that to an early hour, but that's when they originally intended to do that. Well, we were holding services in San Vicente on July 19th, 1953. And I decided I was going to include their name in the project list. And afterwards, I was surrounded by a group of people who were very upset with having the names of these traitors as a part of our cottage list. And just to reveal my own timidity, I lied. I said, a man came to me visiting tonight. He said he was related to the Rosenberg. He asked me to include their names in the cottage list. I've never refused anybody, and so I did. I included their name. Well, that was one of the issues that agitated, that agitated us. Another one, of course, was anyone who suggested that we should be working toward a more peaceful relationship uh, with the Soviet Union, who was our arch enemy. We were sure that Soviet communism was on the march throughout the world and would soon engulf the world unless we took action against it. And of course, we were the first to discover the bomb and use it, tried to keep it a secret, couldn't believe that the Russian scientists could be smart enough to make one of their own. And so naturally, it was easy to believe that they only found out because of the revelations of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. So in the name of that fear, we began to build up this vast nuclear arsenal. 
thousands upon thousands of nuclear weapons, sucking away, these are my words, my feelings at the time, you know, at our resources, commanding uh, the cooperation of our research scientists and our laboratories and, and the like, all in the name of what I believed even then was mutual assured destruction, a kind of suicidal uh, way of responding to the threat posed by the Soviet Union. Well, that, those were among the issues that agitated us uh, back in those days. And my own views about the importance of peace also agitated some of our congregants. But I think a more significant uh, disturbance occurred. We had a few members of our congregation who were members of an organization called the American Council for Judaism. How many of you have heard of the American Council for Judaism? Just a few. Well, um, the, Amer the American Council of Judaism was an organization that came upon the scene in the year 1942. And it began this way. The original platform of the Reform Jewish Movement was instituted in Pittsburgh in the year 1885. And it included these words. We recognize in the modern era of universal culture of heart and intellect the approaching of the realization of Israel's great messianic hope for the establishment of the kingdom of truth, justice, and peace among all men. We consider ourselves no longer a nation, but a religious community, and therefore expect neither a return to Palestine nor a sacrificial worship under the sons of Aaron, nor the restoration of any of the laws concerning the Jewish now that was the position of the reform rabbis of the time, the official position accepted by most of the congregation. Judaism was a religious group, that we're no longer a nation, we're a religious community, we expect no return to Palestine, and that was it. In 1937, in Columbus, a new platform uh, was established by the Reform Rabbi. And it includes these words. Judaism is the soul of which Israel is the body. Living in all parts of the world, Israel has been held together by the ties of common history and above all, by the heritage of faith. Though we recognize in the group loyalty of Jews who have been estranged from our religious tradition, a bond which still unites them with us, we maintain. We nonetheless maintain that it is by religion and for its religion that the Jewish people has, always, has lived. Now, this is, these are the sentences. In all lands where our people live, they assume and, and seek to share loyalty, the full duties and responsibilities of citizenship, and to create seats of Jewish knowledge and religion. In the rehabilitation of Palestine, the land hallowed by memories and hope, we behold the promise of renewed life for many of our brethren. We affirm the obligation of all Jews to aid in its upbuilding as a Jewish homeland by endeavoring to make it not only a haven and a refuge for the oppressed, but also a center for Jewish culture and spiritual life. Well, that sudden interest and focus on 
the rehabilitation of Palestine, the use of the word Jewish homeland agitated a number of rabbis and lay people in the reform movement. And when the rabbis in the year 1942, I believe it was, or 41, supported the idea of establishing a Jewish army which could aid the Allies in their struggle against the Nazis, these rabbis, leading rabbis, many of them large congregations in Philadelphia, Baltimore, and New York, formed the American Council for Judaism, which took a stand against the idea, first of all, that we were a people, they insisted that it was by religious faith and religion alone that we could be defined. And further, the idea about focusing on Palestine as a possible Jewish homeland. And they bolted from the Central Conference of American Rabbis and established their own group. Now, a few of our members were part of the American Council for Judaism. And when 1957 came and we bought the property and began a campaign to raise funds, I was approached by two of the members of the American Council for Judaism, one of them, Jack Skirbel, uh, who was a successful movie producer, real estate developer, who had been a reform rabbi uh, at an earlier time. He had served in, as the rabbi in Evansville, Indiana, uh, and who had already become a benefactor. Indeed, it became a great benefactor to the Skirbo Foundation, which was established and which has done so many wonderful things, many remarkable things. Uh, Skirbo, the very man who had interviewed me, who was a member of the board of our temple, came and said that before we contribute to this congregation and build this congregation, we need to make some changes in our constitution. And they presented me with the changes that they wanted to be made. And among them, was the phrase that says, we are, loy we are loyal only to the United States of America. I saw those words and thought about the loyalty oath that was still in operation throughout the country, about the teachers in all of the schools and the universities who had been required to sign the loyalty oath, about the doctors at Senior Sinai who were required to, loyal, to sign the loyalty oath, and a few of them refused to do it, and they were fired. And they were removed from the staff of Peter. And I had, of course, had been among those who was opposed to the loyalty oath. So I was faced with a crisis about what to do. And I engaged in a negotiation. They had brought a lawyer who was a friend and past president of the congregation. They were all friends of mine. And I came up with words that I thought I was willing to live with, even though I wasn't completely happy with, but I certainly had omitted. We owe our loyalty only to the United States of America. And when the building fund occurred, our expectation that Jack Skirbo would be the leading contributor. He had been one of the founders of this country. And instead, he offered us something so small that it really shook the foundation because we thought that what he was going to do, what would be the impact that on the ability of our congregation to raise the necessary funds. He offered us $5,000 as his pledge. So, faced with this crisis, my friend Tom Freiburg appeared again. And 
he approached our mutual friend, Sidney Brody. Sidney Brody was taller than I am. He had been the president or was the president of the Los Angeles County Museum. He had led the campaign to raise the funds to build the county museum. And he offered to he agreed to become the building fund chairman of Leo Bookstore. And suddenly our hope was raised again to have someone of his distinction to lead our campaign. And in a matter of weeks, we raised the pledges necessary for the amount of money we thought uh, for building uh, was necessary for the building of, of the temple. But that encounter disturbed my relationships with Jack. And later on, he would resign from the temple, and he would move over to Wilshire Boulevard Temple. But it was a kind of crisis, I suppose. At least it was for me. I'm not even sure that I handled it well. Maybe with a little greater maturity, I, I might have been able to negotiate this in a way that would not have disturbed our fundamental relationship. It's a tale I've never told before. I certainly don't want to give Jack Kerbal a bad name. Well, nothing I could say would give him a bad name. <laughs> I mean, he's already established his great significance in the cultural life of the community and the wonderful institution that stands on the hill above it uh, that bears his name as well. Well, these are some of the issues and some of the events of the year 1949. Uh, when the air was clear and you could see forever. And even though some of us were burning our garbage in the backyard, uh, we had those little, what did you call them, Kay? What was, what? Incinerators, yes. Uh, I got confused. I was remembering the smudge pot that in the orange grove that had to be uh, turned on or bi uh, burned when, when the night become too cool. Yeah, we had, each of us had our incinerators in the backyard, contributing our own share, I suppose, individually, all of us, uh, to what came finally to be known as smog, <laughs> but it didn't seem to be so then. Lots, a great deal has happened to the state. We've been through many other issues and significant events. And now here we are today in this still beautiful place, still a congregation with vibrancy, wonder, and the privilege of having you still here, still here to remember and to be grateful. So now maybe some of you have some questions and comments. I'm now going to have to sit down. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, it's, you can be hurt, brother. You're wonderful. <laughs> yes.
He talked about some of the anti-Semitism he experienced playing baseball. I mean, the cat calls that were coming from the dugout of other teams. Uh, on one occasion when he actually moved into the dugout of another team, I forget whether it was the St. Louis Cardinals or whatever it is because of ugly things that were being said. But he didn't talk to me specifically about the anti-Semitism in Detroit itself. And anti-Semitism also was in Detroit because of the workers that had brought to work in the automobile factory from European countries were anti-Semitism. You know, the Slovaks and the uh, other groups. You know, that was true of the little town in which I live. We had one factory, and there was a Jewish procurer. I, that's my word. His job was to go and get people in Europe to come and work in this little factory. His name was Phil Engel. He was a dear friend of my dad. They used to take long walks together. But he brought these Slovaks and Hungarians, and some of them were farmers as well. And anti-Semitism was like mother's milk uh, for some of these people. And the same was true of people who lived in Amtramek and other parts of Detroit. But Greenberg did not talk to me about it. You know there are a number of legends, apocryphal stories about Greenberg, and I'm sure you've heard them all, but I'm not sure everybody else has. One is that in his last year of baseball in Pittsburgh, they played an afternoon game. I guess they were out of town, and they were staying in a hotel, a team, and they went for dinner in the hotel dining room. And there was a drunk at the bar, uh, and he was talking in a very loud voice. And he said, are there any Ginsbergs, Goldbergs, Eisenbergs, or any other kind of kites in this room? And Greenberg arose out of the booth in which he was sitting, and all six foot three inches of whatever it was lumbered. And he lumbered when he walked, and he lumbered over to this man, and he looked down at him, and he said, my name is Greenberg. Will that do? And the man looked up at him and said, I didn't say anything about Greenberg. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, uh, He never talked to me about that story. I hope it's a true story. Uh, <clears throat> that was the year 1947. Robinson had just begun playing for the Dodgers, the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, and they were playing against Pittsburgh, and Robinson got the first place. Uh, and Greenberg uh, said words of encouragement. Don't let them get you down. You're going to do fine, kid. And he apparently was one of the few players, Greenberg was, who encouraged Jackie Robinson. And Robinson later would say of Greenberg, not the words I'm going to use, but he, was, he would have said if he knew it, he was a real match. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, at a time when Robinson was really having a rough time with some of his own teammates, as well as other teams uh, in the league. Uh, my dad and I went to see. Uh, my father was in the ambulance corps in World War I. Uh, he was stationed in Italy. And every year, he would go to the convention of uh, the USACs, the United States Army Ambulance Corps Convention. And 
1947, uh, 48, I've forgotten which, the convention was in New York, and he and I went out to Ebbets Field just to see Jackie Robinson play. And I must say it was an incredible sight to see this one black man in a field of white players. And not only black, he was a very dark black man, a very black black man. And to see him run the bases. The day we were there, he stole second and he stole home. And it was something. Very exciting. And for us, you know, with our feelings, it was... Because we lived in a little town in Michigan in which no black person was permitted to spend the night. A salesman would come to town, an elderly salesman, sometimes with a black driver, and the salesman would stay in the local hotel. But the driver would have to go seven miles out of town to a seedy-looking motel in a little town called Corona, Michigan, which was nothing. The last time I visited Owasso, it was, I don't know, fifth, no, maybe more. Owasso itself had always been a lower middle class town, and things looked bad as far as businesses were concerned. Merchandise was being displayed in the streets on racks. But we drove through Corona, and it was a sparkling shopping center, a huge shopping center, little Corona. And I thought for a moment it was a kind of poetic justice. <laughs> uh, at least. Yes. Yes, Susan. Right. The pulpit furniture behind me, the chair, we don't have the lecterns here. We have three lecterns. We have two small ones and one large one. They're not visible. The pulpit chairs and the lecterns were actually made by Sam Malou, by hand, his work. Uh, really one of the extraordinary woodmakers in the United States. His works are displayed in uh, museums uh, in many places. And one of his works sits in our living room, a beautiful rocking chair. Uh, he designed the pews, but they were actually made by a pew manufacturing company in Stanislaus. I think it's Stanislaus. I think there's such a town in California. They were made there, uh, and all of this wood is Appalachian cherry wood uh, of the pulpit furniture and, and the pews. Uh, Sam and I became friends as a result of his work on the temple in 1962, and I used to visit him frequently, and I ended up being uh, one of those who conducted his wife's funeral. He was a devout Protestant. He was of Lebanese background, Lebanese Christian background, and was just a lovely human being and a beautiful person uh, to come to know. I know whenever I feel the wood of those chairs I, uh, or pews, I remember him. Could you speak a little bit, Rock? Yeah. Never happened. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I'm remembering an event that took place in the 50s. Um, and this is not the best answer to your question or the most revealing one. Um, one Friday night down on San Vicente, I decided to show a film and use it as a basis for discussion rather than give a sermon. 
And the film was put out by the Quakers, by the American Friends Service Committee. It was called Speaking Truth to Power. And uh, it, as I recall, had to do with developing, approaching uh, the Soviet Union in a peaceful way as a way of bringing security and peace to ourselves and the world. I showed the film, it was about a half hour film, and one of our members, Harold Birnbaum, who was a senior partner at Loeb and Loeb, arose. I mean, he seemed like an old man to me at the time. He probably was 50. <laughs> and an older man, certainly. His face was red, apoplectic, with rage uh, about my showing this film on Shabbat to boot. And I looked at him, and I felt like a hiding behind the Torah uh, as he continued to rant. And I remembered a professor of mine uh, in rabbinical school uh, who uh, taught us uh, what was then called social studies. More properly, it should have been called social ethics. Uh, Kronbach had been a rabbi of a congregation in Akron, Ohio, in 1917, and gave a sermon in October of 1917, shortly after the Bolshevik Revolution, and said in his sermon that a great nation is going to emerge from this revolution. And if we greet them with love and embrace them with love, we together, the United States and this new Russia, can create a more peaceful, habitable world. His board of trustees called an emergency meeting, and they fired him. And he left Akron, went to New York, didn't have a job. Stephen Wise, who was a towering rabbi in those days, uh, gave him a job down on the Lower East Side. There, Kronbach would meet his wife, who was a social worker. Event I can't tell you the whole story, but eventually, because he was a brilliant man and a scholar, uh, he was given a position on our faculty. In those days, uh, I would say most of the students smoked. The faculty smoked. We were all called Mr. Uh, we always dressed in jackets and ties when we went to class in rabbinical school. Uh, Kronbach's room, there was a sign that said, smoking is not prohibited, but non-smoking would be appreciated. The legend was the Kronbach's had a daughter, Marion. Uh, the some of the students dated her. They would come to pick Marion up at the Kronbach home. There was an oil painting of Marion over the fireplace, and under it was a little sign, according to this legend, intercourse is not prohibited, but non-intercourse would be appreciated. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Kronbach... Marion would go on to marry my classmate and have a very happy marriage with him. Uh, Grumbach was a pacifist, and he was a pacifist through World War II, very difficult position uh, for a Jew. Grumbach did not believe in argument. He believed that all argument was a form of rationalization. So if you differed with him or a fellow student, in the classroom, he would invariably say, you've heard Mr. Beerman. Does anyone else have anything to say? Well, there was Mr. Birnbaum at Leo Beck Temple ranting away at me, and I remembered Kronbach. And when, I, when he finished, I said, you've heard Mr. Birnbaum. <laughs> Does anyone else have anything to say? <laughs> um, Yes, there were, uh, you know, many other times, not necessarily through 
Well, we had many interesting guest speakers, you know. One of them was Herbert Marcuse. Uh, Herbert Marcuse was the darling of, in the late 60s, uh, part of the student revolt. He was a Marxist. Uh, he had been a member of what was known as the Frankfurt School. Uh, these were uh, historians uh, and uh, who uh, worked out of an institution in Frankfurt which was known for applying some of the insights of Marx to the contemporary problems of the time. Of course, they had to flee uh, because of the Nazi. Uh, Marcuse got a job in Brandeis. Uh, actually, he was at Brandeis when Sandy Reagan was at Brandeis, and I think Sandy had a class uh, with Herbert Marcuse. Uh, I came to be a friend of his. Uh, and he had taken a position at uh, University of California at San Diego. His contract in Brandeis had not been renewed. <laughs> uh, and he was a brilliant scholar, but a very leftist scholar, and a wonderful man, personally. Uh, I actually spoke at his funeral as well. So having Marcuse here was something of a thing. Even having Cesar Chavez here stirred a lot of stirred a lot of feeling, and especially when the entire congregation uh, was uh, engaged in a the grape boycott, not permitted to serve grapes at Leo Beck Temple, uh, and later it was the lettuce boycott uh, that we participated in as well. And some of our members were very distressed. Uh, about, about these things. And over the course of years, you know, there have been members who have been troubled by things I've said from the pulpit. Uh, I am remembering, and I've told this story before, one of those who was a friend, uh, very conservative politically, a prominent entertainment lawyer in town, and invariably he would be upset uh, with my Yom Kippur sermon or whichever sermon. In those days, I spoke on both holidays. And I remember the year, especially 1982. It was the year... I have... Thank you, Kathy. Uh, it was the year of the war in Lebanon when Israel, under Menachem Begin and Arik Sharon, invaded Lebanon, said they were going only to the 42nd parallel, but went all the way to Beirut. And um, this occurred in September of, 40, of 82. And I announced on Rosh Hashanah, my sermon, that I would be talking about the war in Lebanon on Yom Kippur. And this man, his name was Norman Tyre. Some of you may remember him. Uh, the law firm still exists. Um, uh, Norman came up to me after the service and said, I'm so glad to hear that you're talking about the war in Lebanon on Yom Kippur because I'm going to be in India. <laughs> well, last question because I've been told we have less than five minutes now. Yes. <laughs> Yes. I, I don't remember. This is Dick Giesberg, one of the original members uh, of our congregation, uh, who was here before me, actually, I think. Uh, I don't remember the response I got. I don't remember. I can imagine that I would say such a thing, but I, I don't remember. Uh, the flack that I received about that. One of the, yes, one, what? Oh, the question was, uh, I, 
I had announced to the congregation that I was sending a telegram asking President Eisenhower to commute the sentences of the Rosenberg. And did I receive any kind of uh, flack from that? Flack was not Dick's word. Uh, I have some wonderful correspondence. I mean, we still have a couple of members who write to me annually. <laughs> And, uh, uh, but by and large, uh, the congregation and I came to accept one another. <laughs> More than that, I, I feel that we developed a basic trust in one another. And if you have a basic trust, this happens to individuals as well as rabbis of congregation as a foundation, then differences cannot be as profoundly dividing, divisive, divisive, as others can be. Because you have that on which you stand, and you become open to one another in a way that life is the same. Love is I thank you for your love.